to Claire and Darren. Welcome everybody on this Monday afternoon to our cruel embroidery class. Um, Darren is your teacher there on screen showing off some of the stitches that we'll be showing you how to do today. My name's Claire. I'll be hanging out in the chat with you, answering any questions you have there or passing them on to Darren so he can demonstrate for us on screen. I'll also put the handout for this class in the chat so you can download that as well. Um, and of course, as Maddie said, it's being recorded, so you'll be able to go back and watch it as many times as you need to, to get the hang of things if you need practice. And of course, practice, practice, practice is the key to learning anything. <laughs> now that all of that is out of the way, we will let Darren take over. All right, welcome to class. Uh, like everyone's already said, we are learning cruel embroidery today. And uh basic stitches so this is for beginners so if you don't know anything about um embroidery then this is this uh the right spot for you um we're doing cruel embroidery because we're using yarn but you know you can take these same stitches and apply them to standard embroidery and just use regular embroidery floss or a needle and thread uh once you get the hang of the stitches then even with just these few basic stitches you can do a lot of really interesting projects but once you get comfortable with the few stitches I'm going to show you, then there's an unlimited number of stitches that you can learn. Um, honestly, I don't think, I think there are so many stitches you could never learn them all. So um, you, know, you can pick your favorites and really get good at those. So let's go ahead and switch the view to the view of my hands and we'll go ahead and get started looking at him. So a few things you need to get started. You do need um, an embroidery hoop, and it doesn't matter what size the hoop is, um, depending on how big your project is. It's nice to have a nice big hoop so you don't have to keep readjusting your project. Once you get it set, you can just leave it in the hoop. If you have a small hoop and you're gonna do a large picture, then you might have to re you know, take it out of the hoop and then reposition it which is fine, it's it's 100% fine to do that, but if you, it is nice if you can just do your picture all in one. Hey, Darren. Second. Yep. Just remember when you turn your head or look down, we can't hear you as well. Let me bring my computer closer. Okay. Hopefully that'll be good. Um, so it's just nice if you don't have to readjust your hoop if possible. Um, some hoops are better than others. Um, sometimes they slip and sometimes they don't hold it as well. Uh, the ones on michaels.com are nice, so depending on, you know, if you have a hoop or if you want to order a hoop, um, sometimes there's ones that are called no slip and they have a, a groove in them and that holds it really tight, but for this type of work, it's not really necessary. So um, the ones that are available on michaels.com are, are very good and nice to use. The yarn we're using is Lion Brand Heartland. And it's a worsted weight yarn, so it's a number four. And it's plied nicely, it's more of a cable ply. It's a little fuzzy, so um, you should get a nice stitch definition from a yarn like this. And it comes in a lot of really great colors. Um, these are just two colors. Um, here are some other colors, uh, just some scraps that I have. This is a great way to use up some of your scraps because it really doesn't take a lot of yarn to do this. You can use any, <clears throat> any yarn that you want. Uh, you can use a super chunky, you can use sock weight yarn, anything in the middle. Of course, embroidery floss is very thin if you're gonna do uh, embroidery, but you do wanna make sure that you have the right needle size for the yarn you're using. Of course, if you're using very large yarn, you're gonna, you're gonna need a larger needle. And you're gonna wanna think about the cloth that you're working into, because if you have very large, thick uh, yarn, then it's not gonna pass through very dense, cloth. So here I have a piece of old denim. This is a pair of old jeans. And you can do embroidery on denim, but with the cruel embroidery that we're going to do today, the yarn is a little bit um, thick to pass through such a tight weave. And I did want to show you, this is a, a pair of jeans that I have. Um, every time I get holes in them, I just add more patches. And so it's, I think it's a lot of fun. I really love them. Um, but this is just, and I'm going to show you, this is just the basting stitch. This is the first stitch we're going to learn. And I just did all of my stitches in one direction. And then I came back across and did them the other way to make these just little X's. 
And as you can see, I didn't fuss over it. I didn't make, make sure they were the same size. I just did it you know, quickly to make a patch. It's a patch on a pair of jeans. Um, it's fine, right? So you don't have to fuss over stuff and make everything 100% perfect and precise. It's still going to look nice. So I always try to encourage my students, you know, don't overthink it. Don't make it too hard. And as you practice, things will start to look better and better and more precise the more, the more you practice. But I actually like this better. If everything was measured out perfect, I don't think I would like it as, as well. So it's, it's a matter of taste and it's a matter of style and you know whatever suits your taste and your style will be best for you. So um, just the main thing is just to have fun with it and, and to do a lot of, a lot of good things. So um, any size yarn will be good. You do need a sharp pair of, um, of scissors embroidery scissors. Um, it's nice to have a pair of pliers to pull your needle through. Sometimes it gets stuck. Um, you can use a needle threader if, if you need that. It's nice to have thimbles. Uh, sometimes you, know, you can hurt your fingers if you don't have a thimble. But pretty much that's all the supplies that we really need uh, to get started. Any questions about the supplies or the choice choices of yarn? Um, choices of needles. Does anyone have any questions at all? Before, and if you do have questions, please don't be shy about it. I love questions. Any questions yes. at all? Um, yes, um, we've got a couple from a, a student here. Um, just review what kind of yarn is good or maybe what kind of yarn isn't good. Like that might be easier. Um, and then what kind of needles are we using? Are they just like darning needles or are they special embroidery needles? Okay, so um, I can't really think of any yarn that I would say is not good that I would re absolutely refuse to use. I think that mainly would be decided by the type of project you're doing and the type of fabric. So the, your ground fabric or your base fabric would really be the um, deciding factor for that. So like if I was gonna work on denim, I would not wanna use like a super chunky, single ply roving because every time you try to pull it through it's just going to pull apart and if I was working on a really loose um, piece of burlap or something I wouldn't want to use sock yarn because it's probably going to get lost in the weave so you know depending on the fabric wouldn't you say Claire what do you how do you feel about that is there a certain yarn you would never use for this or I would say, yeah, it depends a lot on the type of fabric, um, what sort of, you know, level of detail you want to get. Like a thicker yarn isn't going to give you as much detail as a thinner yarn. Um, and then I would say maybe like a very loosely spun single ply yarn, I think would just might like come apart with all the tension to it. Yeah. I think yeah. it also would depend on what you're going to use the item for. Like if you're making a patch on jeans that you're going to be wearing, you don't want to use like a loosely plied yarn, something that's like a single ply or a roving because it's not going to hold up as well. So um, if you're making a piece that you're going to hang on the wall, then you could use a very loosely plied roving and it's going to work out fine. So, you know, just depending on the base fabric and the purpose of your piece, that's what would um, dictate what it would be good or not good. So any other questions about that? Um, the project bags you or the bags you showed at the beginning of class, what sort of fabric are those? And can you show what the inside of the bag looks like? Oh, so this is just, I think it's cotton. It's just a loosely woven cotton. Um, well, it's not super loose. It's just like normal. Um, you want a woven fabric i would think for especially for learning once you get the good a good hang of it you can pretty much do whatever you want but you want a nice firm um sturdy woven fabric so if you have a really stretchy fabric it's not as as advisable to use a stretchy fabric as you're as you're learning because if you stretch it out too much then when you take it out of the hoop uh, things aren't going to lay be nice. So, you know, once you've had a chance to practice, then of course anything goes, but um, a nice cotton or linen or a nice um, something that's, you know, going to hold its shape, not stretch out of shape, something that's sturdy, but not too dense like denim would be good. I'm using, this is a piece of linen that I have. It's, it's not real loose, but it's not tight either. So 
Um, just a nice, you know, something that's, I mean, you can see how this looks. Is there a certain weight? I'm not sure about fabric, the weights of fabric. So I can't really say like what weight it is or what level it is, but, you know, just something, think of like a nice, um, summer woven cotton shirt. So something about like that, you know, you don't want it to be too thin, but you don't want it to be too dense to pull the needles through. Um, you know, if you get started and it's not gonna work out right, then, you know, you can always think again and try a different kind. Maybe an old sheet, like if you have an old sheet, you could cut squares out of that or an old, like you could do this on the edge of a pillowcase maybe. What, what, what advice do you have on fabric, Claire? Yeah, I would say, you know, if you've got like um, an old shirt or an old pillowcase or something, start with that. Um, or just like a couple of yards of muslin from the fabric store to practice on. Yeah, and you don't need a lot of it, um, unless I'm depending on what you're making. But for practice, you don't need that much. So here's the inside of this. It doesn't look very good. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the inside later, of different theories. So this, I'm not very proud of the inside, but... Um, it is what it is for now, so, all right. Um, there are a lot of needles and there are a lot of needle choices that you can um, work with. The main thing for cruel embroidery, you do wanna find a needle that has an eye that's big enough to put yarn through and you do want it to have a fairly sharp tip. Now this one doesn't have a real sharp tip, um, but it's going to be fine because of the fabric that I'm working with. It passes through very nicely. Um, this one has a little bit of a sharper tip. It's a little smaller. I really like a chenille needle. I think this one is a chenille. Um, a chenille needle, it has a larger eye like this, um, and it's sharp. So it's similar to a darning needle, only it's thinner. It has a sharper point, and it has a larger eye. Um, some other types of needles, uh, just the basic needles that are called just sharps. Um, and that's just for general um, hand sewing use. You could certainly use these. The eye is very small, so probably not for yarn. Um, darning needles are, are nice. And depending again on your fabric, you could use a darning needle. It has a nice big eye for yarn. Um, this certain darning needle that I have here, the tip does look kind of pointy. Some darning needles are very blunt. so. Um, just double check that before you get started. It should be, that one's kind of pointy. It should be pointy enough to go through your fabric. So um, a pointy darning needle would work out. Um, beading needles could work, but again, they're usually very thin, so they're not gonna work as well. This one is, um, it's a doll needle for making dolls. It's really long. Um, you can get these with a larger eye. The nice thing about these, because they're so long, if you're doing, like a lot of stitches in a row, you can weave your needle like this. And, and then like, if you're doing a whole line of like basting stitch, you could weave your needle through and then just pull it, pull it through and do a whole lot of stitches at once. So there are a lot of needles that you can choose and you'll probably find one that you like best. There are needles called, that are specifically for embroidery or cruel. Um, and they have a sharp point um, with a longer eye. So they, some, sometimes the eyes are just shaped round, but uh, like the darning needles or the chenille needles, the embroidery needles and the cruel needles have a sharp point with a longer eye. So they're very similar to a chenille um, or a darning needle. So, but you, what you do want is a needle that is gonna pass through your fabric and will be easy to thread. You don't want to be, you know, suffering with trying to struggle with that. And you don't want a needle that's so big that when you pull it through the fabric and then the yarn or the thread follows it, you don't want to have a hole around the yarn. You don't want it to be so, but you don't want it to be so thin that when you pull the needle through, the very thin needle through, if the yarn's thicker, then the yarn's not going to be able to pass through as well. So, you know, there's a nice balance there. So. Um, does that make things more confusing maybe or less confusing? Um, how do we feel about the needle situation? And I think in your handout, I have a list of all the needle choices and what, what they're better for. Yeah, I think that probably the main question is just making sure that you get a needle that has a large enough eye for your chosen yarn to fit through, right? 
Yeah, and not as super blunt. Like some darning needles I have are super blunt. Like this one's pretty blunt. And I don't, I mean, it would probably pass through this fabric, but not as easily. So yeah, just make sure it's gonna pass through your fabric and make sure you're gonna be able to thread it. And for beginners, I think that's really all you need to worry about. When you're getting into like really um, fancy stitches or detailed stitches, you by then you'll have probably tried different needles and made some decisions about what is better in your hand than others. You know, you'll find one that you really like. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? I think we better get moving on since we're already about 15 minutes into class. All right. So I'm going to just, I'm just going to pop this onto my ring and my hoop. And I'm going to tighten it down. And then you should pull it so that it's snug. You don't want to distort your fabric or overly stretch it, but you do want it to be um, kind of taut or tight in there. Um, you don't want slack or, or to be loose. So they say like a drum, you know, should be kind of tight like a drum, but you don't, you do not want to distort your fabric. And one thing you can look at, you can kind of see my, the weave in mine is kind of a little wavy. So you, you want to make sure that the weave, whoops, you don't want to do that. Do you want to make sure that the weave is kind of going, you know, straight? If you're pulling the weave crooked, then when you take it out of the hoop, it might not lay flat. Like if you're doing really straight lines and you take it out of the hoop, the lines might not be straight because you've you've kind of distorted your fabric a bit. So just kind of get it in there. Um, you don't have to fuss over it too much, especially for a beginner. Um, just kind of get it in there, but you don't want anything stretchy because if you really stretch the fabric then it's gonna kind of bounce back into a weird shape. So um, if you wanna do a specific design, like if you have a picture you wanna do, if you printed a picture or you're working from, you know, you're, somebody wants you to do something or you wanna make something that is very specific, um, you can use these there's different kinds of transfer pens and pencils. Um, some of these, like this one, you can draw right on the fabric and then once you get it wet, it, it vanishes, it goes away. Um, but this, some of this one, this one is a, a heat transfer pencil. And you can get these, I think I got this on michaels.com. I think I bought that at Michaels. But what you do is you just, first of all, you'd have to sharpen it. But then you say so you print a picture from online, like you just print it out or, or something that you're, a friend of yours has drawn or something. And you just trace around it. You know, if you've bought a pattern or something, you can just trace around it with this pencil. And then you can turn it down on your fabric and iron it right on your fabric. So you follow the directions that come with the pencil. A lot of them are different, but you can transfer it directly onto your fabric just by tracing it with this pencil and then ironing it on. So this one is set by heat. And then this one, you can just kind of draw freehand and then it, turn, it just disappears with water. So there are different ways of, um, I usually just draw things freehand because I like like that kind of a feel and look, but you know, for whatever purposes you have and however you like to do it, there are many ways of getting your design on here. So any questions about transferring your design onto your fabric? There's a lot going on even before we get started. Any questions? I think we're ready to do some actual stitching. All right, it's about time, isn't it? So I usually use a, you know, they say when you're sewing to kind of stretch out your arm and decide um, how long your, your um, sewing thread or sewing yarn, it should be about as long as your arm. Uh, if you have really short arms or really long arms, you might wanna you know, double check to make sure it's a comfortable length, but that usually works for me. And for beginners, there are different ways of starting your project, but I just tie a little knot. Um, for beginning, I think little knots are fine, and that's what's gonna secure your thread. Um, we'll talk about some other ways you can secure it as we work, but, and then you just take a stitch from the back, you bring it up from the back, and you pull it, and then you're gonna have a knot that shows in the back, and that's not my favorite thing, but and we'll talk about some other options. Oopsies. There we go. 
And so the first stitch I'm gonna show you is the running stitch, but I did wanna show you what, I like to cheat. I have a couple of things I do that are, um, make my life a little easier, but they, it's kind of like cheating. So you can take a ruler and measure your thumb. And then what you can do is mark on your thumb, if you don't mind writing on yourself, every like fourth inch or every half inch, put a little dash. And then it can help guide the stitches. So sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't do that. Um, if, if you want all your stitches to be exactly the same size, then you know be prepared to you know fuss with that a little bit. But but you can kind of I don't usually worry about it, but you can kind of use that as a guide to see how wide your stitches should be. But I'm probably not going to worry about it too much. It's just a little trick I saw somebody do, and I thought it was really clever. So for the basting stitch or the running stitch, you just take a stitch like that. And then you bring it up. And almost never do I need to work in a straight line when I'm making stuff. So I'm not really gonna fuss about making the line straight. And so this is all it is for the running stitch or the basting stitch. And there are two features to this stitch. This is a very easy, very beginner stitch. Um, you can look at the stitch that's being made by the yarn. Um, you can also look at the spaces that are in between. And one thing you could do is have like very narrow spaces in between. I can see this. Very narrow spaces. Um, depending on what you're doing, you know, how you want it to be. Um, you could have longer stitches. You don't want your stitches to be too long or they might get caught on something and then have very narrow spaces. Or you could have very small stitches, do a very small stitch. My needle came unthreaded. So you can have very small stitches and very large spaces in between. So just by doing this one stitch, you can get um, some different kind of looks. So do a big space and then just a narrow stitch. Or you know, you could start out with um, very small stitches with big spaces, and then you know, gradually turn into something else. And that might be a good look depending on what you're doing. So um, very very simple. And I'm going to come back and show you another little trick. So any questions about the basting stitch? This is a good one to start with because it's very simple. And if you want to, you could measure out on your fabric with that invisible or with that um, transfer pen that disappears with water. If you want them to be very precise, you could mark off, you know, half inch spaces, fourth inch spaces, and you know, work according to that, and make everything really super precise. Any questions? I tend not to be as precise. So you can see my stitches are all kind of different sizes and different sizing with the spaces. Um, and I think it kind of gives it a fun look, but just depending on what you're doing. And then for ending it on the back, I don't like to tie a lot of knots. Knots do come untied over time and they do make your work look, you want your work to look nice from the back. You don't want it to look like a tangled mess. So this is kind of how I just, you can kind of finish it on the back by just kind of weaving in your ends like this. And once you get a little bit more work back here, it'll be easier to do. And then if you really want to, you can still kind of just tie a small knot just for the sake of argument, just for fun. And then just snip it off and then that looks pretty good. See, that looks a lot better than that big knot hanging. So, and then that is the basic basting stitch, which believe it or not, it does come in handy, even though it is very simple. And I'm gonna show you a couple of things we can do with that stitch to really dress it up. So 
Um, I'm just going to start off again with just a knot. Because I think that's I think that is the best way for beginners to start. Because if you if you're trying to get overly fussy with things as you're learning, it can be very frustrating. So I'm going to bring this new yarn up. I'm going to try to come up through the same hole that the original color came up through. Sometimes that's easier to do than you think. All right, now I'm not gonna sew through my fabric anymore. So watch what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna go down and this is called a wrapped or a whipped running stitch. And then I'm gonna go back up. So I'm just weaving this orange yarn through the gold. And this can give you a very nice kind of a solid line, but it's kind of wavy. It's not like perfectly straight line. But as you can see, that changed the look of that stitch quite a bit just by um, doing that. Is it better? That's not better. Okay. So that um, changes the look of it. And then another thing you can do is if you have two of them right together like this, you can kind of weave them together. And this is good um, sometimes if you want to do a border or an outline of something. You could go back there, you could go here, you can do anything you want. And so with just by doing this one stitch, you can get several different looks, depending on how you space them apart and if you want to wrap them or whip them. You can really you know, give it a different look. So any questions about the um, running stitch or about the wrapped running stitch or the, the ones where we join it. So. so I'm just going to just move over here. What next one are we gonna do? So now we're gonna do the back stitch. And this is one of my favorites. And I use this stitch a lot when I'm just hand sewing as well. So the back stitch, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a stitch. It's just like starting the basting stitch. You're just gonna start with a stitch and then you're gonna move ahead, take another stitch. So it really seems like the basting stitch all over again, except now we're gonna go back and we're gonna enter the fabric through the same hole that we came up here. So we, we're gonna jump back and fill in that space. And then we're gonna go forward, um, one stitch space, or however wide you want your stitches to be. And then we're gonna come back and go right down through that same hole. And this makes a solid line And you can do curves, you could do zigzags, you can use this to write words. You can, I, I use this for seaming when I'm sewing by hand a lot. I feel like this back stitch is very secure um, for joining fabric. So this is, any questions about the back stitch? Are you able to see what I'm doing? And then you just jump back and go through the same spot you came up. So we'll come up here. So I came up here, go back down through here. And you can get a very nice, very nice straight line. Okay. Any questions about the back stitch? No, nope, looks good. And so now the split stitch turn my thing. I like to have my um, I like to kind of work away from myself, so I turn it to work away from myself. The split stitch is similar. So you start off with just taking a stitch just like the back stitch or the running stitch. And you can do the back stitch two different ways. I think the more official way is then you bring your needle up 
through the stitch. So you're splitting it. That's why it's called the split stitch. And then you take a, take a stitch and then you come up and you split that stitch kind of right in the middle. And then you take another stitch and then you split it. And this is called the split stitch. And you get, it looks a little bit different than the back stitch because you're splitting those stitches and it almost looks like a, um, almost looks like the chain stitch or it almost looks like little kind of braided or little crochet, like a crochet chain. So it gives it a nice texture. And then another way to do it is instead of coming up from the bottom to split it, I take a, it's kind of like the back stitch. It's kind of like split back stitch. And then I, I think this is the way I usually end up doing it because I feel like I can see what I'm doing better. So I come up like I was gonna do the back stitch, but instead of going through the same hole I came up through, I split the stitch this way. So you could do it either way. You can come up um, and split it from the bottom, or you can split it by going down through the top. And I feel like both are good choices. How, how would you do that, Claire? Do you, have you ever done this stitch? Um, I don't think I've done this particular stitch before. I was thinking the name sounded familiar, but I confused it with something else. <laughs> okay. We have question any questions? On this, yes, um, I would apply to this one and then um, specifically for the back stitch as well. How would you do a curved line with those rather than a straight line? Um, I, that's actually easier. So let's, let's just, Let's just draw a little curve. And so then you just follow, you can just follow your curve. And then if you're going around, you know, a very tight curve, you can use smaller stitches to kind of help define that shape of that curve. If you want to get a very sharp or very defined, my yarn is splitting. But yeah, these, the, all of all of the stitches I've shown you so far uh, would be very nice for going around curves. You can like if you're doing vines on a flower or something, you know, you can do curves, you can do angles. And if I took smaller stitches, I could get a, a crisper curve. Especially when I'm demonstrating, I usually don't take small stitches because I'm trying to show as clear as I can. But it's pretty easy. You just kind of follow your curve however you like. And does that make, does that help? Yeah, I think that's helpful. When you were saying smaller stitches, it reminds me of, um, I had a couple of friends in marching band and the people on the inside of the line as the marching band is turning, take much smaller steps. So that's mm. one way to think of it. That would make sense. I was never in the marching band, but that does make sense. So any questions about anything we've covered so far? I think we're moving along pretty fast. We might end up early, finishing early for once, Claire. Oh, you always say that, and then we never do, Darren. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, we did have a question a while back, and I don't think I got the clarification. Um, someone had asked about using um, multiple yarns, and of course you can use multiple yarns like within the same project, but could you hold like two strands of a yarn together if you wanted? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you just want to think about what you're doing. So if um, if you're going to hold two strands together, make sure that your needle is going to be, um, you know, large enough to help help work with that, and make sure that it's not going to be too thick to fit through your yarn. But you can certainly, and what that's going to do is that's just going to give you a, a bigger line, of course. So I'm going to do my split stitch, and that's just going to give you a like a more defined line 
but you certainly can. And you wouldn't have to, like I just doubled this yarn, but I could use one strand of um, Heartland and I could use one strand of like some leftover sock yarn that I have, put both of those together. And then it's just gonna make a nice kind of twist when you work with it. And it could look, it'll look very nice, you know, depending on what, say like you wanted to use like a dark green, um, Heartland and then a light green sock yarn to kind of add shadows and definition that could be very pretty. You could really do a lot of different um, thing, different, get a lot of different effects by doing that. So it's a very good idea, I think. What do you think, Claire? Yeah, I was thinking that especially for shading, that might be a good technique. Um, or no, especially in like knitting right now, it's very trendy to use a strand of like a fuzzy yarn with a, a non fuzzy. And so that will be another way for you could add texture to the project. Yeah, I'm glad that's still in knitting. I love doing that. I love adding a strand of mohair in with my knitting. Okay, any other questions or ideas? But if you get an idea like that, and you know, like later on when you're just practicing and you don't have anyone to ask, my advice is just do it. If you get an idea and you think something's gonna be nice, don't hesitate to do it, just do it. Don't do it on your project, maybe do it on a practice piece, but you know, definitely if you think of something, even if somebody tells you you can't do it, then I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try it. And uh, maybe I'm sorry, but maybe you, know, maybe you come up with a really good idea. So I'm, I'm all for trying stuff. Okay, so that is split stitch doubled. So we've done um, basting stitch and the whipped basting stitch. We've done back stitch, which is also good for hand sewing. Split stitch. And now we can do, um, I think chain stitch is next. I do like chain stitch. So in the back, now that I've got, you know, some a little bit more substantial stitches back here, this is kind of how I would finish it. I would just kind of weave my ends you wanna make sure you're not pulling it tight because you don't wanna distort the front. So you just wanna hide your ends. And so I, I like to weave them in the same color that I was working on on the front. It's kind of like how you do for knitting or crochet. And at this point, I don't even feel like I wanna tie a knot. I would just snip it off because I felt like that was substantial enough that I could um, trust it to be done. So that's how I would finish it without, without tying a knot. But if you, if you just wanna tie a knot and call it good, then you know, that's fine. And as you're practicing, maybe you wanna try different ways. But you know, for, for starting, I give you know, everyone permission to just do whatever's easiest for learning. And then you can practice and get better and better as you go. Let's look at chain stitch. Let's see, you want to split your yarn. And I'll go ahead and do this doubled since we talked about doubling our yarn. Let's just go ahead and work with the double. Maybe it shows up better on camera too. So chain stitch, start, they all start off the same so far. You just take a stitch. So starting with basting or back stitch or split stitch, they all start off the same. See my yarn's a little thick, so it's not pulling through quite as nice so just make sure you're pulling your yarn through all the way and you're not leaving any loops. And so again, you're just kind of leave a space, like a stitch space, however big you want your stitches to be. And they can be any size depending on, you know, the aesthetic you want. And then instead of going back down through that hole like we did in back stitch or splitting it like we did in split stitch, we're gonna slide our needle under it. So we're not piercing the fabric, we're just sliding under. 
And then we're going back down here where we came up. And this forms, it looks like a chain or a braid. And then you just um, leave a length, a stitch, a length of where a stitch is gonna go. However, you know, people say, how big should the stitches be and how, you know, it's up to you. Um, you don't want them too big or else they'll, they won't look as nice and they'll tend to get caught on stuff. But you know, if it's your project, you can do it however you want. And then go back down right where you came up. And see, I think you can see this yarn might be a little big doubled because it's not flowing quite as nice as it was when it was singled. So for this fabric, you know, this might be a little big, but it's, it's working all right. But if I were doing a whole big project, I might not enjoy it. So you know, leave your stitch space, just slide under that stitch. We're not piercing the fabric, pull it through. and then go right back down where we came up. And you can kind of see how that looks like a chain. It kind of looks like a chain or it almost looks like a row of knit stitches to me. What do you think, Claire? Yeah, I think depending upon the orientation, it's either like a crochet chain or like knit stitches. So it counts yeah. as both. So any questions about what I'm doing or how to do the stitch? Are you able to see it clearly? Okay, so that's pretty much the chain stitch. So has anyone done embroidery before or is everybody new? Is anyone working along and you're able to do them with me or how are we feeling out there? Seems like we've got a good mix of beginners and people who have at least some crochet experience. A little crochet? Bit, yeah. Crochet experience or embroidery experience? Embroidery, sorry, I'm getting my crafts all mixed up today. You know, they're all the same. <laughs> really, they're all the same, right? right? We love them all. Yeah. Um, we did have a question um, specifically on French knots, which I know right, is a cruel embroidery specific technique, but. We're coming up on a French knot here pretty soon. I can do that next if we want to. All right, so that is the chain. And again, chains, um, I'm kind of going in a straight line, which I don't know why I always do that when I'm teaching because I hate straight lines. Um, but a chain, it would be very pretty to make like a curly cue or you know, you can do a wavy vine, like similar to these other stitches. You don't have to do them straight. They're, they're nice for curves. You can do angles, you can do straight lines. Um, these are all very flexible and, and nice for you know a variety of designs or ideas that you might have. So. And then for finishing it, you might just want to weave it in kind of like we did before. Or you can just tie a knot. But my great grandmother always said that the front of your work or the back of your work should look as nice as the front or almost as nice. So um, you know, I don't always make mine look as nice, but I do try to make it look reasonably nice. So, and I don't know about, I haven't done a lot of embroidery and taken it places, but I do know whenever I wear a Fair Isle sweater that I've knitted, somebody always says, let me see the inside. Somebody always wants to look at your floats to see how nice your floats are. There's always that person. So if you have an embroidery project and you're working on it, somebody's going to say, let me see the back because they're gonna to wanna to see it and see how good you're doing on the back. So there's, just be prepared. There's always that, that person is out there. So have you ever met a person like that, Claire? I guess I don't wear my fair isle out that much. <laughs> I've always had, I always have that. Every time I wear it, somebody's always like, let me see the clothes, let me see the inside. And I'm like, you've got a lot of nerve, but 
my floats are good. I'm not afraid of you, so I got good floats going on. So. All right, let's see if I can do a French knot. Yes, I think the question was specifically that they're always coming undone or they just don't look quite right. You know, French knots do take a bit of practice. I must admit that they do, they're very easy. And once you get the hang of it, if you don't do them for a while and then you go back and do one, you might have a problem. But, you know, once you really get a good um, grasp on a French knot, they're not so bad. And we'll talk about a few things we can do. So I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do two strands held together. I'm going to use this yellow and orange. Oh, actually, Darren, we did have someone say that the two strands was making it a little extra confusing. So can we just stick with one color for now? Um, let me do the French knot first, and then I'll do it with one color because I wanted to show how pretty it is. Okay. Um, because if, if I've done them before with like pink and purple, and it almost looks like a rosebud the way it's, the colors twist together. So we'll do it both, we'll do it both ways. So I've switched to a larger needle and it doesn't have a sharp of a tip, but it's working fine for this fabric. So just um, bring your needle up from the back and then wrap your needle with the yarn twice. Let me see if I can. You see, I can't really lift it and wrap it at the same time, but just wrap it twice. Sometimes I wrap it more than twice. And then what you want to do is you want to go back down, but you don't want to go back down in the exact same spot that you came up or else the whole thing can pull out. And when I learned this, somebody told me to put it down um, to go back down through the exact same hole you came up from. And mine, mine always slipped out. And then somebody else told me, you don't go through the same hole, but you go through like one thread or two threads over. So you want it to be very close. Um, but for a nice big yarn like this, you can get away with a little bit of slack. So, and then you pull it through. And it gives you a nice knot. And I wanted you to see how pretty that is with the different colors. So if you were making flowers or something, you know, it can give you a nice effect, like, like a little rosebud or something. And then you could do a little green around it and it would be very pretty. So I have done that before. So let me cut this. I'm not gonna tie it because we're just practicing. I'm gonna switch back to a single color if it's easier to see. And then we'll talk, we'll show it again. I'll talk about a couple of things too that'll make it easier because I've had these I've struggled with these two and they seem like they should be super easy and they really are but there's just a couple little things we can do to make it e even easier so bring your um yarn to the front i just tied a knot to control it in the back so just bring it up wrap your needle twice sometimes i do it more than twice but i think twice i'm gonna do it let's do it four times just to see um, but what you want to do, though, is you want to kind of keep that close to your, you don't want to have a lot of um, slack in it. You want to kind of keep it close um, to your um, fabric. Oops. So keep it close to your fabric. And then I'm going to go down right next to it. But you can see as I'm doing all that, I'm holding this. Um, working yarn kind of tight. I'm not letting there be a lot of slack. And I've, I've noticed that when I hold it tight, um, I don't know if I'm controlling it better or if I'm seeing what's happening better, but I always have better luck. And then when I pull it back down through, and my yarn's a little thick for what I'm doing. So pull it back down through, keeping that um, kind of tension just kind of controlling it with my thumb. And then as I'm pulling it tight, I'm kind of hold, I'm controlling it from the back like this. I'm not just pulling it from here. I'm kind of 
you know, kind of guiding it with my um, finger and thumb and holding it right close to the fabric. So that, that way I feel like I, I'm controlling it better and then I get a nice knot. Um, I have noticed that it does work a little better. Um, when I just, when I'm not paying attention and I just then do it like this, um, it usually works, but sometimes I've noticed that's when it pulls through and that you don't get, and this knot is looser. You can see how it's looser and that might be pretty um, for a different, you know, one's really tight and this one can be looser and that's fine. Um, you might, maybe you want them all the same or maybe you want them to be different. If you were doing um, say like a, a tree branch and these were like the little buds of a leaf, or like apple blossoms, some of them would be bigger and some would be smaller. So, um, but if you're outlining like a, a design and you just want the French knots, you might want them all the same size. So you know, just think about that as you're doing them. Does, does that help with questions about it? Because I understand I've had problems with French knots before. But this has been my best solution for a French knot. See, I didn't, I didn't control the slack and hold it as tight and that's a nice big loose knot. So that could be the difference. And then what you can do, it's not gonna work well with this particular yarn, I don't think because it's kind of thick. You can come back up through that knot and then kind of re-secure it if you're really worried about them. You see how I kind of came up through the knot and then back down through the knot and I kind of tacked it down a little tighter. And so that's gonna be extra super secure. So if you're doing these like on a pillow or something that's gonna get a lot of use, um, maybe, maybe that's an option. So, but it's not necessary, but sometimes we do these extra things just for peace of mind so that we don't, you know, we don't, if you're giving it as a gift or if you're selling it, then you'll just know that you've made it extra secure Any questions about the French knot? I hope that was helpful. See that when I hold it tight, and kind of control it a little bit more, it's a much kind of um, smaller knot. So you can get a lot of different looks. And then if you double it, you get this nice look. So any questions, Claire? Is that how you do it? I think those are good tips because yes, I've always heard, you know, you, you come up and then go back down through the same place and like, wait, then aren't you just sort of like pulling it through to the other side? So, well, yeah. And I mean, in theory, I've seen people do it that way and I have done it that way and been successful, but as I'm doing it that way, I'm always thinking, you know, this could just pull back through over time and I don't, I never feel good about it. So then I, somebody else told me, no, that you, you, go over a couple of threads and then that's going to be much better and I found that to be it's more logical and which I'm not always you know up for the logical answer I'll admit that but it is more it makes sense I like things to make sense and it, it were, I've had a very good result by doing that so yeah that's the French knot and they're very cute you can use French knots um, you could fill in the entire center of a flower with French knots and it would be very pretty like a sunflower um, you can use them individually, like little blossoms, like I was saying before. There's so many things you can do with French knots. They're very cute. You can do lines of them just for decoration. You could outline something with them, um, keep them really close and tight together and be very pretty and very textural. But, you know, it's very handy to have that in your pocket. Um, do a French knot and give you a lot of really nice texture. Okay. Any questions about anything we've done so far? Uh, can you show us the chain stitch with just a single strand of yarn? So with the chain stitch, you start out just by taking a stitch. So you're kind of starting out like the basting stitch or back stitch, and then you come up ahead of it. So just leave a stitch length, however you want your stitches to be however long you want them to be. 
and then you, instead of going through the fabric, you slide this needle under, under that stitch. You slide it under the stitch, pull it snug. You don't wanna pull things too tight either. Just pull everything snug. And then at this time, you do wanna go back down through the same hole you came up and then just kind of snug things up a little bit. Come up ahead of it. Um, let's do a little curve. So come up ahead of it, uh, leaving a stitch length. Slide under. So we're not piercing the fabric and we're not piercing our yarn. We're sliding under it. So we're just sliding under it. Pull things a little snug. And then back down through the same spot that we came up through. And in the back, as I'm working, I don't know, I'm, I'm pushing it with my finger to make it a little tighter right there. I don't know if you've, you know, and sometimes I realize what I'm doing as I'm teaching and I forget to mention it, or sometimes I do mention it, but I'm holding it kind of snug with my finger I'm pushing up on it. That makes it a little bit tighter here and easier to work with. But then also when I'm putting my needle through, I can feel the needle brush my finger. It's not through the fabric, you know, I can kind of feel what I'm doing. And that makes it a little bit easier for me to kind of control what I'm doing. I don't know if that's something that's helpful or not, but that's kind of how I do it. And so that I'm going to, so you can do nice curves. Does that help? Any other questions about that? And so you can, sometimes you can see how I'm even pulling it tight. I'm kind of getting this raised. So you could get a nice little edge on something or a nice little, like, like almost like a lip or something like a three dimensional. Or you can kind of hold it down flat as you're doing it so that you're not pulling it tight and get more of a flat. Any questions? Uh, Tina wants to know, do you ever use a thimble? Actually, I'm surprised I don't have my thimbles on. I usually almost always use thimbles. I bought these cute thimbles off eBay too, because don't you wanna have cute thimbles? I did, so I bought some. Yeah, I usually do use a thimble actually. With this though, you don't need them as much because the, the fabric is so open that it's easy to pass the needle through. But when I'm hand sewing, I do like a thimble. And then you can use that to push your needle through if you need to. Um, and sometimes, you know, with what I'm doing now, it's not necessary, but sometimes you'll, you'll want pliers too to lead your needle and pull it through. Um, sometimes when you're sewing, it can be very, um, dense fabric are gonna be very hard to pull the needle through. And so it's nice to have thimbles and pliers to help you. But usually in cruel embroidery though, you, it, because of the fabric, usually it doesn't, it's not necessary. Do you like a thimble when you sew, Claire? I don't think I actually own a thimble. Claire, I'm shocked and ashamed. <laughs> Well, I don't do that much sewing. Yeah, but if you do get a thimble, get pretty ones because these are like super fun to have. Oops, I should probably put them on different fingers as I show them. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I wanted to let everyone know, I mentioned that I put the handout in the chat earlier. I forgot that people on a mobile device, like a phone or an iPad or another tablet, um, can't download from the chat. So we've got a Google Doc link that I will go ahead and pop into the chat now. So you can access that online and then download from there as well. All right. See, it's five o'clock and I'm not quite done. I never finish early. So this is stem stitch. Let me show you stem stitch real quick. So stem stitch, you, um, it's almost like, again, like basting, these are all very similar. So you leave a stitch length and you go down, 
but you don't pull it tight. You leave this slack here. You leave this loop and you want this loop facing down. And then you come back up in the center of that space. And then you pull that slack. And then you go down again, leaving a loop, leaving some slack. And then you come back up in the center. And you pull it tight or well, snug. You never want to pull anything too tight. You always want to make sure your loop is facing down and you'll get a very nice kind of twisted rope look. I'm kind of taking big stitches because I want you to see what it looks like. So this is the stem stitch and this one is really good um, again for curves. Uh, you can do stems with it like it's called. You could do tree branches. You can do pretty much anything. You can do writing, but you can see it gives it a um, kind of a twisted rope kind of a look. It's very pretty, very pretty. And if you use all these different stitches in the same project, you can get a, a different look. So like this one, see I've got my French knots here, which kind of look like um, like little buds off of leaves that might be opening in the spring. Um, this is just a basting stitch. This one is the um, basting stitch, but I whipped, did a whip stitch around it. Um, this stem is, um, looks like that is chain stitch. Um, this one I think is splits. Now this is here a stem stitch. See how it's, I don't know if you can see it's twisted. So just using all of the, this, the petals of the leaf are, are the, petals of the flower are backstitch. So, but you know, it's kind of cute. Um, and then as you practice, you know, you can do fancier and fancier designs, um, but this is a really good kind of beginner's design, you know, just kind of do it free form. You can sketch things out a little bit if you want, but you know, don't, don't get too fussy with it as you're learning. So um, a friend of mine named Rhiannon made this for me a long time ago. And this is done with thread, but it's the same stitches. This is looks like back stitch, and then these little stars are just um, little X's. So similar to what I did on my jeans, they're just like uh, basting stitch, you know, with X and X on it instead. So, but very simple stitches. But look how pretty that is. It's so cute, and I keep I have it hanging by my front door, and it's and she covered the back. So I don't know what her stitches look like on the back. She put a cover on the back, which I'm not going to peek at them. I'm just going to trust that the back looks very, very professional and beautiful. Okay. So lots and lots of things you can do. Um, one of my favorite YouTubers for um, embroidery, I'm going to plug her. I hope it's okay. Her name's Mary Corbett, C-O-R-B-E-T. And as homework, I want you to um, search her and look up the Hungarian braided chain. That is my favorite. I love doing that stitch. I'm not prepared to show it now. Every time I do it, I have to watch her video first and do a quick review. But um, look up the Hungarian braided chain. It's a really fun stitch. It's, it's advanced beginner. So like if you've never done this before, don't like start with that one. But she has great tutorials on so many stitches. You'll, you'll love it. Anything else before we go, Claire? Any other questions? Any loose ends we want to tie up? Um, I'll go ahead and put the handout in the chat again as the PDF and then as the link to the um, Google Doc for anybody on a mobile device or a tablet. And then I wanted to make sure that everybody knows about our upcoming classes. Um, for any crocheters in the crowd, that's going to be our next class on August 22nd. Um, you can join us for a premium class on shaping and seaming as we make a cute little heart-shaped pillow. And then coming up in September, I'm not sure if these are quite live on the Michaels website, but if they aren't, you'll get a little preview. Um, we're going to be teaching string art on September 12th. So that's another one where you don't need to know any knitting or crochet at all. And then September 19th, we're going to be doing punch needle, which is another different yarn craft that's not knitting, not crochet, not weaving. Another thing to do with all of the yarn you might have. Yep. Yeah, it's fun to learn other things besides knitting and crochet. So if you do have questions later on, feel free to contact me on 
You can send me a direct message on Facebook. Just search for my name and you'll, you'll see my picture. Um, send me a direct message with any questions you have. Or if you um, are on Instagram, maybe Claire will put my Instagram name in the chat. It's Mr. Wooly Bear, M-I-S-T-E-R, and then Wooly Bear spelled out. Um, and just send me a direct message with questions. And I don't get I don't get very many questions, so don't hesitate to send me one. And I can usually answer fairly quick. Um, and I'd love to see if you make something. I'd love to see so you can tag me in it or send me pictures. It'd be it'd be really fun. So. Um, thanks for coming to class. Don't forget to practice because that's when the learning really happens when you have it in your hand and you're practicing. So keep practicing. Good night.